Good day, everyone. Today I want to talk to you about this great book by Nicholas Goodrick Clark called Black Sun, Aryan Cults, Esoteric Nazism, and the Politics of Identity. This book um, was put out by New York University Press. And uh, just let, let me just tell you a little bit about Goodrick Clark. Um, he passed away about 20 years ago, I think. He was a uh, historian at University of Oxford since 1975 and he studied things like esotericism he also had other books such as Hitler's Priestess which was about a Savitri Devi and also the occult roots of Nazism secret Aryan cults and their influence on Nazi ideology so he already had a kind of background in this kind of stuff and um, oh, he also wrote a book about Blavatsky Helena Blavatsky and her ideas nice little book that I might review that in the future um, but let me just talk about this book today now this book was printed in 2002 or at least that was the final version I think um, and uh, let me just tell you about the chapters and then I'll go through each chapter very briefly so the first chapter is about American neo-nazism and um, you know how that kind of developed but he goes into American neo-nazism sort of throughout the book not just in this chapter but he gives a little overview in this chapter some of the um, people involved like Rockwell and others how anti-semitism became a major theme in America and uh, how some people still clung on to that after the war after World War II and um, stuff like that. So sort of how people blame Jews for certain problems in America and also how these people were networking with British neo-Nazis and fascists, etc. Okay, so that's a nice overview of that. Well, you know, when I say nice, I don't mean that I like it. I just mean that it's a good overview. Um, I'll get on to Goodrick Clark's politics later on. Um, he was obviously not a Nazi. He was trying to expose this stuff and show how dangerous it is and how this is like a dark side of mysticism and esotericism. Okay. The Zog, the Zionist occupation government idea, which is used by some white supremacist militias and anti-Semites. So the idea that Jews secretly control everything, including the federal government. This was an idea that influenced Timothy McVeigh, who um, obviously is famous because of the terrorist bombing he did in Oklahoma, targeting a federal um, facility, killing many people. Right. Um, anyway, but that's that's that chapter. Also, the Toner Diaries. Let me just mention that's a white supremacist um, novel, and it talks about this race war which would take place in the US and then the white race would come to ascendancy again after a horrible war with other ethnicities that sort of became like a, a bible in a way for some American neo-nazis and uh, was promoted for that reason um, talks about Aryan nations the Church of Jesus Christ Christian so some of these groups were Christian uh, based, others were more pagan. Yeah, so that's American neo-Nazism. Then it goes into British neo-Nazism. The second chapter is the British Nazi underground. Again, very interesting um, because here you had another country which was part of the Allies in World War II, but it still had this substantial neo-Nazi um, contingent in its population all those you know very much a fringe group after the war but then it did it did gain some steam among some youth especially so this chapter talks about John Colin Campbell Jordan okay um, the British People's Party which is an anti-semitic party there's a lot of it. This is a very dense book, so it's very hard to sort of get the main points because it's got so much information in it. This is talking about 
the uh, immigration issue in Britain, where many immigrants from India and Pakistan and the West Indies um, were starting to go to Britain in the 1950s and so on. And this caused some resentment against a white working class people because they perceived the foreigners as getting their jobs or being um, contemptuous of British law. So that sort of was the environment in which some uh, of these white working class people came to adopt Nazi or fascist ideology, okay, and were susceptible or vulnerable to the ideas of um, neo-Nazis. Uh, there was something called the National Labour Party and the White Defence League. Okay. There was also a lot of infighting among these people. So some of them wanted to be the leader and they had like splinter groups as well. So um, what else? Uh, Jordan, um, he, he renamed his faction the National Socialist Movement. Uh, he had a falling out, I think, with somebody else. The, somebody had an affair with his wife, I think, and then um, he, he formed his own movement, if, I'm, if I recall correctly. Okay. Um, now, sometimes these groups would try to foster an image of respectability, and other times they would be more about, like, street thugs and violence, and they would play to the skinheads, uh, the neo-Nazi skinheads. I don't want to label all skinheads as neo-Nazis because actually that um, aesthetic motif was co-opted by neo-Nazis. But anyway, the neo-Nazi skinheads um, were sometimes utilized by these groups and sometimes more of a distance was made to give the groups more respectability, or at least the leaders more respectability. Um, sometimes I also emphasized rural and agrarian forms of living because they saw the city as being corrupting and um, Jewish controlled, for example, and they wanted to get uh, the white race back into the countryside to be more healthy, um, get close to nature for the same sorts of reasons that the Nazis did. There's sometimes a neo-pagan element to all this, so an emphasis on Norse gods and stuff like that, quite common. Uh, that's certainly a theme that Goodrich Clark picks upon, um, you know, picks up on and um, analyzes in this book a lot. You also had, um, Britain was the site for a lot of neo-Nazi um, conferences. Uh, so you had Jordan, Rockwell, Savitri Devi uh, and others joining together in these conferences and sort of discussing what direction they should take. But yeah, that's the um, British Nazi underground. Eventually, like the police broke it up. Um, it was infiltrated and it did lose steam eventually, thank goodness. But there was that sort of brimming resentment that a lot of white people felt towards foreigners. And um, yeah, he, Goodrich Clark gives his, own, gives his own opinions about that later on. I'll get to that as well. Um, the next chapter is about Julius Evola and the Kali Yuga. Julius Evola was an Italian traditionalist. Maybe it's not correct to call him an outright fascist, but he's certainly become popular again in the writings of um, fascists and so-called alt-right traditionalists and those sorts of people. Um, there's a press, uh, what's it called? Um, Arctos. They're based in Hungary. I think they used to be based in America, but then they moved to Hungary, which is now run by a kind of authoritarian personalist ruler, Orban. And um, Arctos, you know, puts out a lot of traditionalist tracts, tracts including by uh, the Russian philosopher Alexander Dugan. But anyway, Julius Evola, very popular in that sort of circle. He, um... Even though he was not arguably an outright fascist, he did admire the Nazi SS as a sort of knighthood and the model for how society should be. He was a philosopher. He was also into 
he had a kind of Eastern bent to his ideology. So he talked about the Kali Yuga a lot. This idea from Hindu, uh, Hindu religion that the world is in a sort of dark age and that it'll eventually ascend to a golden age, but that it goes in cycles. Okay. We'll see the Kali Yuga later on as well. Very important idea among neo-fascists. He was uh, anti-egalitarian, anti-democracy, anti-liberal, and anti-Semitic. Though he wasn't quite as monstrously anti-Semitic as, say, Adolf Hitler. Um, he did certainly have his anti-Semitism as an important part of his worldview. He um, inspired uh, Italian neo-fascist terrorists in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, they, the far right carried out a bunch of um, terrorist acts in Italy. So did the, the, the left, okay, um, the Red Faction and so on, the Red Army Faction, uh, the Bader Meinhof Gang in Germany, um, etc. And other groups in Japan and America. But the far right also had its terrorists. And many of those, especially in Italy, were inspired by Julius Evola's writing. Okay, so he has sort of a mystical outlook, um, talked a lot about spirit and, um, you know, divine energies, stuff like that. Had a kind of contemptuous attitude towards women as being beings who cannot really think for themselves, and they're just there for the purposes of male coitus, for the benefit of male coitus, right? He um, was into uh, Tantrism and Kundalini Yoga. Okay. Um, so yeah, very important figure as well. He um, believed in a kind of uh, royal, a sacred regality. So this idea that in the deep past, there were these um, philosopher kings and he admired um, certain civilizations as being close to that ideal. So he admired Indian, the Indian caste system and um, monarchs in India, like, you know, thousands of years ago as being embodiments of that ideal, that you did not have a separation of the clergy from the royal family. They were one and the same, and they were the best people for that job, right? So he saw like a natural hierarchy to everything, nature, and to human society, and that it was a kind of natural, spiritual hierarchy. So you can see why he might admire somebody, uh, people like the Nazi SS, who, in their own mind, they were embodying a kind of natural ideal as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Imperium and the New Atlantis. This one I don't really remember very well, but I think, yeah, there was this guy called James Maddol who died in 1979. He set up um, Nazi organization in the US. He was inspired by science fiction. He believed in, um, I think he believed in extraterrestrials and that maybe the, the Nazi or the white race hailed from extraterrestrials. He set up like anti-Semitic um, sort of demonstrations and stuff like that in America. He hired these sort of this goon squad to protect his um, protests as well. Okay. He, um, I think he, well, one of the people involved with him um, had a kind of weird pro-Soviet um affiliation or position in, in that they supported the Soviet Union as a, oddly enough, like an ideal society, which was efficiently run just like Mussolini's Italy or Hitler's Germany, which is complete nonsense. Um, the Soviet Union was not efficiently run at all. It was also a, you know, communist state, uh, which most fascists are vehemently opposed to, but somehow he found um, one of these people found a um, an accommodation with the Soviet Union, at least in propaganda, as like a bulwark against supposedly Jewish-controlled America. 
Uh, yeah, Maldola was influenced by the American fascist intellectuals Fra Francis Parker Yoki and Frederick Charles Weiss, both of whom favored a pro-Soviet position against the U.S. and world Jewry. So kind of weird. You do get these far left, far right um, overlaps sometimes. Horseshoe theory, as it's called. Um, he was associated with uh, something called Imperium. And, and the new Atlantis. So the idea of Atlantis, um, you probably know, comes from Plato. But a lot of Nazis actually love the idea of Atlantis because it speaks to a kind of lost civilization which they can paint as being like a white utopia which was corrupted or you know collapsed and then um everything went to shit so they want to sort of revive that as, as a that's like the focusing mythology okay so you do get a lot of atlantis mythology in neo-nazi literature but yeah i don't remember that chapter too well um a lot of weird crap in there as well. So, let's see. Anyway, but let me just um, keep going. Uh, I should also mention that there was an attraction of theosophy for Madol. Okay, he also took upon some aspects of Ariosophy, which is something which uh, developed in Germany in the run up to the Nazis, very weird religious, uh, racial religion. Okay. So you do, you do get like some infusions of theosophy at times and some infusions of Ariosophy into neo-Nazism, which is not, of course, you know, to say that theosophy is Nazism. It's not, it's just that you do find it sometimes in these, in these groups. Savitri Devi and the Hitler Avatar. Savitri Devi is really interesting. She was born in in Europe. Her parents, I think one of her parents was from England, the other from Italy or Greece. Yeah, I think Greece. Um, she adopted Hinduism. She um, saw Hinduism like the uh, Brahmanical caste system as being the ideal because you've got like a small elite which she saw as a racial elite and then everyone below that and she saw Hitler as an avatar okay who would bring in the Kali the Satya Yuga so to free the world from the Kali Yuga and bring it into the golden age um, she was actually also a an informant for the Axis, so she gave the Japanese um, intelligence during World War II in India. India was still a British colony, uh, but yeah, she was helping the Japanese who were allied to the Germans. After the war, she traveled back to Europe. She saw the ruins of Germany, and uh, she wrote some books and other, other things uh, talking about her travels and her complaints against the uh, the Allied victory. She believed that Hitler was kind of on a spiritual plane, but that there was going to be another savior of the white race who would come and be even more ruthless than Hitler, if you can believe it. Um, and then he would um, restore everything to the Satya Yuga. So she believed in these cycles, okay, Hindu cycles. Um, she was very contemptuous of Jews. She actually, um, what, she, she loved animals. She was very humane to animals. She was a vegan, but she, um, wanted to exterminate the Jews. Okay. And almost blood curdling when you hear what she said about Jews and how she kind of regarded genocide as completely acceptable, really vile person. Um, She met a lot of the Nazi, the neo-Nazis in Europe after World War II. Um, she traveled to England and other parts to meet with them and sort of work out strategies or to form alliances with them to sort of set out what to do. And 
Yeah, even though even when she wasn't allowed to be traveling, um, she she was still doing it anyway. She got arrested when she was in Germany for spreading Nazi propaganda. She actually made friends with some of the SS uh, former SS um, people who had been imprisoned. Uh, but yeah, when she was released, she um, kept doing that sort of stuff, um, spreading leaflets and so on, writing books. She traveled back to India. And uh, she, I think she died. No, I think she died in, I forget. It might have been in England when where she died, but um, she did live in India for a long time. And um, she never repented her beliefs. She always believed that um, National Socialism was the law of the universe. She actually said that it was literally the fabric or the law of nature. Um, because, you know, in nature, you've got animals eating each other, uh, the weak being vanquished by the by the strong. And she saw that as a reflection of uh, Nazi, the Nazi political system, or rather, I should say the other way around. The Nazi political system was just a reflection of how nature works in her view. So Nazism, in other words, was like speaking to a cosmic truth in her eyes. The Nazi Mysteries, chapter six. Very interesting, this chapter. It talks about like the novels and fictional tales which were written by not just Nazis, neo-Nazis, but also by just uh, adventure novelists and uh, others, kind of tapping into the mystique of Nazism after World War II. People obviously felt revulsion against Nazism, but they they also felt a, a sort of, um, you know, morbid curiosity about it. And you saw this in many books and movies. Um, there was a fixation on certain uh, objects like um, the lance that pierced, um, you know, Jesus's body. And, uh, you know, Hitler was reputed to have been obsessed with that. The Holy Grail as well, which Himmler was meant to have been obsessed with. And th that sort of stuff. You know, Indiana Jones, if you've watched that movie, sort of picks up on that theme. There was also like a lot of spiritualist stuff involved as well. Um, travels to D Tibet. So in some of these stories, he had um, Nazis traveling to Tibet, which they did do in reality, but it wasn't to the you know the, the extent that they did in these novels. Um, and they were sort of seeking some sort of ancient power or energy source. And this got it, you know, kind of got tied in with theosophy, some theosophical themes um, got blended in as well. Um, Shambhala and Agatha were features of these stories. So these sort of underground cities of wisdom. And um, for some some people, um, namely the neo-Nazi authors, they were acting as a kind of... Uh, the stories were acting as a kind of resuscitative mythology. So even though Nazism had been vanquished there was still the hope among these quarters that it could be resuscitated again. And um, these stories kind of helped inspire some other people to carry on that dream. Okay, there was also stuff about the Thule Society, uh, which got completely overblown. There was a Thule Society, but it wasn't, you know, anywhere near as powerful as some of these stories made it out to be. Um, All that sort of stuff, okay. So lots of weird stuff in there, sometimes involving UFOs and flying saucers. Uh, completely unworkable in reality, like none of this stuff would actually work. Just from logistical reasons, it would never work. But anyway, they were fantasy stories after all, but they did express a deep-seated desire among some people to bring back Nazism. Okay, now um, Wilhelm Landig and the Esoteric SS. This is chapter seven. Landig was a uh, uh, he had been in the SS during the war, 
He formed something called the Vienna Circle in Austria after the war, bringing together former SS officers and other Nazis um, as a kind of resuscitative circle, okay, trying to bring back the hope for a Nazi revival. He wrote novels as well. So he was within this sort of circle of authors who were, or this general genre of authors who were uh, writing Nazi mysteries, okay. He wrote a lot about flying saucers, um, adventure stories with, with men going to Antarctica and then South America and um, Tibet, having adventures, having battles and skirmishes with the Soviets and the Americans, who he saw as being two sides of the same coin, you know, controlled by the Jews. And um, yeah, just a series of novels going into those sorts of adventures. He talked about the Black Sun, very important metaphysical object, um, alchemical symbol, beloved of many neo-Nazis, sometimes used as an alternative to the swastika. He talked about um, how some of these uh, these commando groups would travel around in flying saucers of various types, sometimes out of Antarctica. Antarctica is very interesting, I think, because it's sort of like a landscape which is completely barren and, well, not completely, I mean, there are animals there, but pretty much it's barren and um, it, it almost acts like a kind of backdrop for a archetype of whatever you want to impose on it. So in the case of the Nazis, um, it would be archetypes about race or whatever they want, okay, imposed on that landscape. Also, these stories did not have many women in them. They were mostly just men. And that sort of was, I guess, aiming to, uh, it, well, the idea that um, it was like a man's job to bring back Nazism without any distractions from women, I guess is the um, idea there. He also talked about Tibet, adventures in Tibet, something called point 103. Location is very important in these sorts of stories, um, I've noticed. So you've got like sort of sacred places, um, you know, point 103, you've got the Blue Island, um, Thule, Lemuria, Atlantis, Shambhala and Agatha, etc. Some others. And um, they're sort of, they, they play like a metaphysical role in these stories. Sometimes also the hollow earth features. Hyperborea is another one. You hear that a lot. Okay, so that's Wilhelm Landig and the Esoteric SS. And obviously they're trying to tap into like that cosmic energy of the black sun okay so it is it's a kind of a science fiction story um type genre but it's also a spiritual slash esoteric slash mysticism type genre very typical of neo-nazism actually or at least some of these currents within neo-nazism chapter eight goes more into the nazi ufo myth and also antarctica and aldebaran or aldebaran so you know, post-World War II, after Kenneth Arnold's sightings, that sort of sparked off the UFO wave. And the flying saucer, you know, the term flying saucer, even though he described them as being skipping over the, you know, through the air like flying saucers, uh, saucers skipping over uh, water, um, that got mistranslated in the media, and then that became flying saucers, and then people were seeing circular objects. But the flying saucer... Uh, which hailed from Arnold's um, misquoted, you know, sightings, you know, really did play a big role in neo-Nazi um, esotericism. And you saw that with the exaggeration of certain actual projects which went on in Nazi Germany. So the Nazis did have a bunch of Wunderwaffe or wonder weapons. These were like the V2 rocket, the V1 rocket as well which is a cruise missile, actually. 
um, and uh, jet planes and other things which were very advanced for the time. And um, within that sort of milieu of technological developments, you also had stories coming out about people working on flying saucer technology. Um, except to a very limited degree, uh, these stories are completely fake. They mostly come from engineers who worked for the Germans during the war and after the war they wanted to sort of build up some no notoriety for themselves and they would implant fake stories into the media crediting themselves with major technological insights and stuff like that. So those sorts of stories grew up in that period, became popular. You know, I mentioned Wilhelm, Wilhelm Landig as one of the purveyors of that. But um, yeah, the idea of Antarctica, very important, as I mentioned. Nazi bases in Antarctica with UFOs flying out of them, carrying these um, Nazi commandos, you know, around the world. And um, basically the idea here is that the uh, UFO wave was actually just um, German technology being viewed by the people of the world after World War II. And that these this Nazi uh, flying saucer fleet would eventually um, get bigger and bigger, and then they would bring back the Nazi regime in a Fourth Reich. That was the hope. Some of the stories um, expanded from the actual U-boat landings in Argentina. So there were like a couple of U-boats which did, um, you know stop in Argentina, their crews surrendered, but that, that, that was it. But some of these authors um, of these mystery stories, they use those sorts of genuine stories to say that maybe Hitler was taken to Antarctica or some Nazis were taken to Antarctica to start a Fourth Reich, okay? And then they built a UFO fleet. Sometimes the UFOs actually directly carried the Nazis to Antarctica, but usually um, I think the more common story is that the U-boats carried them there along with their supplies and then they set up the base there. Um, some guy called Eric Halleck, okay, he was part of Wilhelm Landig's circle and he talked about um, flying saucers and also the Black Sun. He um, actually analyzed um, George Adamski's account of a cigar-shaped mothership, and he said that that was a giant Nazi saucer uh, spaceship. The V-7 was one of these supposed flying saucers. Okay, there were other ones as well, uh, like the Bell. You might have heard of the Bell or Die Glock. Um, but, you know, like various little sources and then you had the big ones carrying the little ones stuff like that now Ernst Zundel as well major holocaust denier very famous neo-nazi and white supremacist he actually used flying sources as a device to attract young people to his way of thinking he actually admitted this later on that he didn't believe any of this flying saucer stuff but um he wanted to use it as a vehicle for smuggling in neo-Nazi ideas. And now, if you think about it, that's very, in a way, logical, because the idea here that he's trying to promote um, is that if you can show that history is a lie, that, you know, the liberal world order has lied to you, the Jews have lied to you about um, UFOs, then what else might they be lying to you about? Maybe the Holocaust didn't happen, for example. So it's like a vehicle to sort of soften you up so that then you can believe in even crazier stuff. But yeah, that's a very interesting chapter, okay? Um, you even get Nazi UFO myths to this very day being promoted by people who are not themselves Nazis. And uh, I find that very interesting and disturbing as well. It talks here about Carl Jung, okay, famous uh, psychoanalyst. He uh, he was famous for his archetypes idea. 
he um actually wrote a story or a, a novel sorry not a novel um a, a short book about uh flying saucers where he gave a Jungian well obviously but his um archetypal take on that and he saw um these as mandalas okay a symbol of unity of self and absolute wholeness which like in the Cold War era, the nuclear powers were facing each other with a threat of nuclear holocaust, and so the mandala might have been a symbol for unity, okay? And um, Jung was not a Nazi. Um, he actually, I think he harbored Jews or somebody, um, pe people persecuted by the Nazis, if I'm not mistaken. But um, uh, interestingly, he did have a relationship uh, or friendship with Miguel Serrano who's the next the subject of the next chapter but Jung actually features a lot in this book because um he's been used his ideas have been used by neo-nazis a lot uh, which he would not have wanted also ironic that for him the saucer was an object of unity but for many nazis like it's an object of Aryan supremacy which goes against other races. So the opposite of unity. So it can be used both ways. And it has been used both ways. Um, the other thing was Aldebaran, uh, which I should have mentioned before. Oh, Aldebaran, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Now, Aldebaran star system, it's an actual star system. It's been um, touted in a lot of this Nazi literature as a kind of origin or sometimes the origin sometimes the eventual destination for the Aryan race so the idea is that the the Aryan race um, derives from extraterrestrials who are themselves like supermen perfect Nordics etc um, and they're kind of communicating with us through the black sun um, and they want to you know help the white race and that the, in some stories there's even like a Aldebaran fleet coming to help uh, the white race on Earth. And it'll get here any minute. So, you know, those sorts of stories. Complete nonsense, but um, again, you do sometimes hear about Aldebaran, Aldebaran being referred to by people who are not themselves Nazis. Pretty, you know, exciting fiction, but um, there's no evidence for it. Miguel Serrano and the esoteric, an esoteric Hitlerism. Uh, Miguel Serrano, the um, Chilean diplomat and esoteric Hitlerist. He, uh, what, he was in the diplomatic corps until um, the Allende um, presidency. Allende was the left-wing president who was elected and uh, overthrown in a coup by Augusto Pinochet. But Pinochet also did not really care for him. So Serrano kind of traveled around Europe um, eventually, um, you know, talking to people, getting ideas to write his books. He was interested in Eastern mysticism and philosophy. He was into Kundalini yoga and also Vril, this idea of the Vril. Uh, Edward Bulwer Lytton, he wrote a story in 18, when was it, 1870 something, about this underground race of super beings who use Vril, this kind of magical vital energy, and they would someday take over the world. But that was complete science fiction, but it's made its way into some neo Nazi literature. He also originated the idea of, or at least developed the idea of the Green Ray. Okay, so let me just read you something which is going to sound really weird. Um, so this is just an excerpt from the book. The gods dwell at a remote place in the galaxy, perhaps even beyond, illuminated by the black sun, which is beyond our golden sun, and invisible from Earth. Sometimes Serrano suggests that this place is beyond time and space, in another non-existent universe in the green ray. Okay. So uh, he believed in gods and this sort of real type energy, the black sun and these cosmic emanations. He also believed in a kind of alchemy that uh, the world was going through a Kali Yuga and then into a 
Satya Yuga, although he feared that it was going into a leaden age, which was even worse than an iron age. And um, all that kind of business, right? He also had ideas about Hyperborea and the Hollow Earth and also um, Agatha and Shambhala. So he believed all of this stuff, basically. He also believed that you could turn into a UFO or a flying saucer through an act of sheer will. And he believed that Hitler had done that. This was actually meant to be like a organic entity which could replicate. So, um, yeah, really weird stuff. He believed in a kind of, um, spiritual racialism. Okay. And, um, transformation through yoga. He, um, talked about the Templars and, um, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes, and the Vikings as well. So lots of that kind of stuff mixed in as well. So, like a pseudo history of all this uh, racialized and mysticized. He was also, I think, into, yeah, he was a friend of, um, I mentioned Carl Jung. Um, for Miguel Serrano, Carl Jung's archetype was a literal embodiment of actual gods, okay? The gods of the white race. Whereas for, <clears throat> um, you know, Jung, it was just like a psychological predisposition or memory, collective memory. Um, Serrano said that Jung had merely psychologized something much more profound. And uh, he obviously took it to extreme lengths, which Jung did not find very appetizing. I don't know exactly when they had a falling out, but um, they eventually did, I guess, over politics. Um, now, in the middle of the book, you've got some images. Um, it's all black and white images, but still, they're pretty good. One of them shows um, American Nazi Party leader George Lincoln Rockwell addressing a rally in Chicago in 1966. Then you've got Matt Cole as leader of the National Socialist White People's Party. Uh, Colin Jordan's White Defense League and John Bean's National Labour Party holding a joint demonstration in Trafalgar Square, London, in 1959. One of the people there is holding up, well, actually over the podium, there's a symbol saying, Keep Britain White. Okay, and then it's got some pamphlets there. The Threat to You, as in you, the white working man, from foreigners. And uh, there's some other images here, which are pretty interesting and disturbing. There was a magazine called Rising. Okay. A, a booklet for the political soldier. This was a British magazine. This was for, um, you know, aimed at white people. It was inspired by Julius Evola. Francis Parker Yoki in court in San Francisco, June 1960. There's a picture there of Savitri Devi, Miguel Serrano, and um, the Hindu Nordic esoteric anatomy in Miguel Serrano, Adolf Hitler, El Ultimo Avatara. Okay, that was from 1984. It's like showing diagrams of his um, idea of these energies. So there's like a golden sun and a black sun center in the body. Uh, Landig and others. Aryans Awake, advertisement for Aryan Nations, 1997. It's showing like a Nordic, uh, like a Viking style guy with a sword and spear. Um, anyway, but let me just continue. So yeah, Serrano believed in like chakras and all that stuff. That you could direct these cosmic energies by moving around in certain ways and concentrating those energies. That you can do that through yoga and meditation. Um, he believed in extraterrestrial Aryan gods. Okay. And the black sun, as I mentioned. Okay, chapter 10, white noise and black metal. This is really interesting. It's about like the 
heavy metal and thrash metal scene in America and uh, Europe and Britain and um, how they use music to kind of push their ideas onto the youth especially because it was a kind of transgressive thing about um, you know death metal and that sort of music which can be used right um, because if you're already transgressing certain social expectations and you can sneak in some even more shocking themes and ideas so it's like a vehicle again just like ufos were but this time through music some of these groups um were quite successful in successful in um selling records you know music records some of them sold like many tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of copies including in west germany okay which was experiencing a immigration um infusion and that led to resentment and um or when you know when i say led to resentment i should say that these groups exploited that and created created the resentment although there were probably many problems already inherent in you know immigrants coming from very different cultures uh, you're always going to get some problems but these nazis um really tried to exploit that um so yeah some of the some of the groups that I already alluded to um, were that they had their hand in some of the music, promoting some of this music because they saw it as a very useful vehicle for spreading their ideas. A lot of the titles of these songs and records had transgressive names like the Antichrist, okay, Survival of the Fittest. Some of them were like pushing a kind of um, Darwinian idea of um, that the strong should uh, you know crush the weak you know, obviously that's not what Darwin literally said that the, we should do that but you know it's getting this idea of natural selection and then misapplying it to human society so this idea that um, crushing the weak or the sick is natural and good um, some of these groups also were were vehemently anti-Christian. They saw Christianity as a kind of slave religion um, and that it was a Jewish religion, right? That it was imposed on the white race to make them weak and compliant and open to corruption and miscegenation. So they often would, at least some of these groups, um, would sometimes pay homage to Satan or to uh nordic uh, pagan gods right instead of to jesus christ so more about that in that chapter there's a lot of detail in here again i'm not i'm just giving you a very brief overview um nazi satanism and the new eon this is chapter 11 okay so I mentioned the music, but Satanism was actually a fairly important aspect of neo-Nazism um, because, again, Christianity was seen as like a religion which was undermining the white race and that the white race was tricked by Christianity into being meek and um, forgiving, etc., whereas it should be strong and ruthless. Okay. Now, that was not like a universal aspect of these groups, but it was an important sub subgenre within it. Different, um, some groups like were very much uh, Satanist. Others were not very religious in terms of having one denomination and others were more Christian in their outlook. So it really depended. There was actually a lot of variation. Okay. Oh, um, sorry, I just saw something. No, may, maybe I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> Christian identity and creativity. The Christian identity movement. This was a kind of biblic biblically inspired group, which, um, you know, it saw as itself as Christian and that the white race was the chosen race. Okay, this was, if you've heard of the Ruby Ridge incident and um, the guy 
involved in that had joined uh, Christian identity, even though he was not a very vehement supporter. But that sort of that tragic incident in which his uh, wife died, um, the FBI, I think a sniper killed her. And, um, you know, that set off a lot of resentment in the white supremacist movement. And it caused many people to become white supremacists. Or, you know, when I say caused, you know what I mean, like in influence them to do that. Even though there were other things as well. Um, but yeah. So I think that inspired actually Timothy McVeigh as well. And then there was the Waco siege. If I'm getting the dates correct, the Waco, you know, you probably know about the Waco siege uh, where many people died. That was also seen as a federal attack on, you know, white um, sovereignty. But yeah, again, very strange ideology, um, very specific take on Christianity, very racialized, obviously. There was, um, there were calls for race war in the US by some of these types of groups who were pushing like a Christian edge. Obviously also the Satanists were doing that, but um, so were these Christian groups. I don't know which group had more of a resentment towards the government specifically. I suspect it was actually the Christian groups, but I could be wrong about that. Then there was a Nordic racial paganism. So this chapter talks about how Nordicism, this idea that, um, you know, it's a racial idea, uh, pushing the, <clears throat> the category of the Nordic race as, uh, having its own racial identity and essence, and also its own spiritual aspect. And that was expressed through paganism by these uh, believers. So the idea that there are these gods in the forest or in nature, that white people should live in close proximity to nature to get in touch with these gods, and that people should reject um, monotheism as well. Okay. So that was a fairly common aspect. Sometimes it was used almost cynically or opportunistically by the leaders who didn't really believe it themselves, but they thought that it was a useful instrument to sort of inspire people, uh, get them interested. So other times uh, the leaders as, as well did believe these things, or at least they believed in a sort of watered down version of it. Chapter 14 is conspiracy beliefs in the New World Order. So conspiracism is a very big aspect of neo-Nazism. You see, uh, you know, I alluded to the federal government as a symbol of um, resentment by these groups, as a focus of resentment, and um, that it's Jewish controlled. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is seen as like a like a secret police for the federal government and that these um the government and its various organs have to be destroyed including through armed uprising uh mcveigh was obviously in that category so you know the idea of the illuminati as well very the Illuminati is not just present in neo-Nazi literature, it's also literally everywhere in conspiracism, conspiracy theory, ideology. Um, there was also this guy called William Cooper, who was a kind of right-wing libertarian type. He was not himself a racist or a white supremacist, but some of his ideas um, really pushed conspiracism to extremes, and the sorts of motifs and themes that he pushed were very reminiscent of what you heard in neo-Nazi circles, even though he rejected the racism. He actually thought that the government had engineered the AIDS, uh, HIV virus to kill black people and homosexuals. Um, right, so yeah, conspiracism, very, very important. Um, David Icke as well. You might know about David Icke, British conspiracy theorist, believes that reptilians are controlling the world and that there are royal bloodlines, you know, connecting the British royal family with the American presidency and that there are these families who control the world and that they're all reptilians from some other planet. 
Um, those sorts of ideas actually have got anti-Semitic roots because if you think about it, the um, the reptilians have a love of gold, and you know, as Jews are meant to have, um, they are essentially different than human beings. And um, you know, in Nazi propaganda, the Jews are different to white people and other sort of parallels like that. I don't think that Ike has ever willingly pushed Nazi ideology, but a lot of his ideas are very uncomfortably close to it in many ways. Okay. Um, so yeah, sometimes these people pick up ideas from anti-Semites or Nazis without necessarily knowing the source of those ideas. And then they kind of spread around. Sometimes neo-Nazis don't outright say, I'm a Nazi, but they will say, uh, have you heard about this um, conspiracy by the government to do this or that? And then they sort of use that as like the entry point. Okay. Um, Mark Kornk, a senior member of the Michigan Militia. He was a... Uh, he had written for Nexus magazine on America's secret police forces, claiming a background in military intelligence and command experience in special warfare units. Conk brings apparent authority to his account of FEMA um, and other things. Yeah, so it's kind of like um, a constellation of ideas and you've got neo-Nazis sort of tapping into it and infusing it with um, their own ideas and sometimes it just gets spread around by people who arguably should know better but they they don't because they're so enamored of the conspiracy angle that their thinking is not very careful so that's just an, a warning as well to any anyone listening to this that um, you should always consider your beliefs and where they come from because you might be spreading ideas which are very harmful Okay. There's a lot more in that chapter about militias and conspiracy cults. Also, New Age beliefs as well have become part of this. Um, and then there's the conclusion, the politics of identity, which talks about um, how certain segments of white society, white working class have seen themselves as distinct, having their own identity to other parts of society. And his own, his own take... I think he was actually a conservative, a political conservative, which in some ways is a is a benefit because you can't accuse him of being like a bleeding heart liberal, right, or a leftist. So he's coming at this from the point of view of that there are these um, very dangerous groups and ideologies threatening the established order of society, um, that they can get up to a lot of mischief and trouble. And that certain things which are being done by the government um, in the name of, you know, political correctness and welfare are actually making this more likely to erupt into something very, very dangerous. Um, I don't know how much I agree with him on that. He seems to blame a lot of this on political correctness and um, affirmative action. But I do, I do understand his point that sometimes these things can go too far and that they should be done with the greatest care because you don't want to make enemies unnecessarily. People who already feel alienated, um, you know, you don't want to f throw more fuel on the fire if you can avoid that. So, you know, even though um, there is no anti-white conspiracy, there is the possibility that a lot of white people may interpret certain actions by the government or policies as being unfair, etc., and then that can feed into white supremacism. So that's a big debate, but that's sort of the point that he's trying to make there. Um, but anyway, very good book. I really recommend that everyone read this book. It's got, well, total page count is 369. That is including the uh, index. The index is pretty good. It's got an extensive a section there about the notes for each chapter so you can do more research there very well written quite entertaining even though it's a very disturbing 
topic, obviously, but it's a very, very important topic. This was written in 2002, as I mentioned. Um, but, you know, these issues are still going on now. In if, if you look at, like, Twitter or whatever social media space, you'll see weird Nazi-style ideas floating around and uh, being used by various unsavory characters. So it's important to know this stuff and where ideas come from. So I'll put up some more links in the description so you can check out more um, analysis on this. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.